Welcome to the Data Color 2012 webinar series. I'm David Toby, and I'm joined here. I'm joined here by David Saffer, who is not going to be making the presentation today. What David is going to be doing with us today is answering questions and taking down questions to answer later. So we've kind of swapped roles. What I'd encourage you to do is to put your control bar somewhere that you can see the uh, the questions and answers so that you can catch those as the webinar progresses. And uh, I will be covering introductory concepts of motion imaging for still photographers. So I'm going to beg your mercy that you, you not flood us with advanced video uh, topic questions like codecs and uh, and recording methodologies because that's really not what we're focusing on here today and we're not really prepared to answer questions on, on some of those advanced topics. So most of this has to do with uh, video with DSLRs for people who traditionally do still photography and what they need for hardware, software, equipment, uh, learning, training. And uh, it really will focus on that plus, of course, this being data color, color management. So I'm going to start here. I believe you can see my first screen, and I'm going to ask Patty to start um, forwarding the screens, and we'll start the presentation. Okay, here we go. Recent DSLR cameras. So this is, oh, most all the high-end Nikon and Canon cameras, and now Sony's and a range of others are shooting not just video, but HD video. So this is really, it's hard to distinguish this from the real thing, the stuff that TV and movies are made from. In fact, the was it last year that the final episode of the series House was shot entirely on Canon 5D Mark II cameras because there were a better choice for the location that that show was shot at, which was in a supposedly collapsed underground parking garage where they had very limited room and very limited light, and so those cameras were a much better choice for shooting there. Now, the fact that you can shoot HD video literally puts you know, the ability to make video into the hands of photographers who never even asked for it. You may have a camera that shoots excellent video now, even if you've never tried using it. So before you look into making video, or at least look into it seriously, you need to rethink a whole lot of things about what kind of equipment and tools and software you might need. And that's really what this present presentation is about. So there are plenty of new areas you might want to learn things in. And we'll take a look at a few of them as we go along here. Next slide, please. So motion is converging. Now, you can say that in a, in a general sense. If you go to Los Angeles, you'll find that the industries, the TV, movie, video industries, they're no longer using separate rental and, and, and sales houses. Um, the, much the same equipment is carried in all the places. And 3D, which is another form of movie making, and animation, which to some degree is more up in Silicon Valley than it is down in LA. All of those are merging, and all of those are capable of being done much more affordably. I feel badly for the people who spend a million dollars on on rendering suites just before it became possible to do this on affordable equipment because they may never make their money back. So time lapse is another thing which is really done with still cameras and it's not really when you take it a video but it ends up being one when you're done. So all of those are, are merging into one field and one field that is possible with um, affordable equipment and the same cameras that shoot still to some degree. So. Where, here's our first poll question. So first thing I have to request is do not fill your poll answers in on the video chat, on the audio chat. There you go. Fill them in here by selecting one of these choices. And we'll take a look at your answers as soon as, uh, as, soon as the poll completes. So it'll just take a few seconds. And once you've, most of you have filled them in, they'll uh, pull up our answers for us. There, here are our answers. At least I'm seeing them. 
uh, 36% said, I don't shoot any video yet. So that's about a third of you. Another third of you said they shoot some video but not seriously. And then we have just under a quarter that use video for actual products and only 5% saying that it's a mainstay of their imaging work. So we targeted this webinar for people who are not serious existing videographers and that's certainly who we've got in front audience. So that's good. I'm talking to the right people. So let's move on to the next uh, slide and, and look at this. Let's think about studios. One of my favorite studios to shoot in is my friend Sarah Silver's studio on Broadway in New York City. She shoots mostly fashion, glamour, dance in the studio. It's got two and a half story high windows on the front. It's a gorgeous place to shoot, hardwood floors. Here's the problem. I shot a video there with Sarah and a full video team. Oh, back one please. Uh, just last year. And the, the joke was, I'd never realized this is on Broadway. It's above, the, it's above the subway lines. And we had to stop many times during that day of shooting to let a train go by and start over. So there are different characteristics for a sound stage than there are for a photo studio. Good acoustics, lack of echo, lack of outside noise, the kind of isolation that you don't normally have in a photo studio. So those are all thoughts to be considered if you're going to be shooting video. And we all love strobes because they're very affordable, cost efficient, and effective for still photography, but they cannot be used for video. So we're looking into continuous lighting, be that fluorescent, the little uh, spiral bulbs, or be it uh, the new flat LED panels, or various other types of continuous lighting. So you may Next time you go look for lighting, you maybe uh, want to consider lighting that will work for video. Similarly, I have just replaced the heads on all my tripods with wonderful ball heads, which are fantastic for still and pretty much useless for video. So I'm now using my oldest tripod for my most serious work in some senses, which is just bad planning on my part because uh, you know we, we now need isolated motion uh, heads if we're going to shoot video, which means yet more purchases in the uh, in the tripod department. And um, something that became very apparent, a, a fellow I know by the name of uh, Vincent Laferre became quite famous when he got one of the first 5D Mark II models uh, before they were released. He's one of Canon's explorers of light. He only had it for a weekend. So he rented a helicopter and got two models and went out and shot a low light uh, video with it. It's a gorgeous video. It was the number one uh, hit on Canon's site for the entire next year and a half after it was shot. And it moved him from being a still photographer to being a cinematographer. But the joke is, he didn't hire actors. He hired models because he was a still photographer. Well, they didn't have any lines, so he got away with it. But there's, there's some thoughts to be considered here when you're, when you're hiring people for motion. And they have to move well. They have to speak well different than hiring a model who just has to look good. So with, with motion comes sound, and with sound comes music, and we'll get into some of those factors as we go along next. So computer considerations. If you were going to buy a new computer today, uh, there would be all sorts of options that would be just great for Photoshop and for image editing. However, for video, you are going to want you know, the fastest processors, the best graphics coprocessors you can manage. Uh, you're going to want the biggest internal hard drives you can get as well, though that's probably pretty standard for photography too. However, something most of us aren't all that familiar with is the idea of a fast screen. I can remember when someone first said fast screen to me, I didn't even understand the concept. It has to do with latency and how quickly the pixels change. Uh, this does not matter in Photoshop, but at 30 frames per second it matters indeed. So you may need to, as LCDs are getting to be faster over time, that's why they're able to replace plasmas as TVs now. But uh, it's something you'll want to check when you buy a new screen. There's another spec to check. What's the latency? How fast is it? Would it be good for video editing? Now, HD, that buzz phrase that has to do with uh, how many lines of resolution you get in your screen. Uh, it seems like HD is kind of a global standard, but when you think about it, what you really want in a computer monitor is to fit a window that holds all the pixels of HD onto your screen 
and have other stuff outside that. You want palettes and controls and things in addition to HD. So the, the, <laughs> the computer I'm working on right this moment fits that description. It's an Apple uh, Resna, Retina display uh, MacBook Pro. So the Retina display refers to a resolution beyond HD that makes it just utterly perfect for video editing. Also makes it very difficult to use for GoToMeeting. When I signed in with this laptop and brought this presentation up, it was gigantic because of the pixel count on this screen. That's why we're running it from another computer so that you can see it on your screen. So I'm going to have to uh, talk to go to meeting about the fact that retina display computers appear to be uh, unusable for, for go to meeting. So as well as wanting immensely high resolution on your screens for video, you're going to want huge file storage and fast transfer. Now the, the latest fast transfer, I mean USB 3.0 is good, but the stuff that Apple's making the big buzz about now and that is becoming available on PCs as well, the uh, Thunderbolt stuff, no photographer needs Thunderbolt unless their goal is to transfer their entire image library, meaning every photo they've ever taken in their life, over to another drive conveniently and quickly. Uh, short of that, nothing you do really requires that level of speed. However, video requires that level of speed on a regular basis. You're forever moving large amounts of data from one place to another and then trying to store it long term. So, so big RAID file arrays and fast transfer protocols are stuff that you need to consider when you're, uh, when you're considering doing any serious quantity of video. Next. So here we go with lenses. There's such a thing as a cinema lens. Now the, the lenses that you have with your DSLR camera, even if you buy top-end Canon or Nikon lenses, they're wonderful lenses and they can shoot video. However, there are certain subtle advantages to dedicated cinema lenses. For instance, they have geared rings and by gearing that means you can put external attachments on to make smoother and automated uh, zoom and other transitions and uh, they have manual aperture rings rather than having the aperture controlled internally and they're what they call, I love this term, de-clicked. Think of a fishing reel. If you turn the, the click pawl on a fishing reel off so that it spins freely instead of going click, 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 well you have the same thing here. By de-clicking a lens, you instead of having it jump from one aperture setting to the next, click, 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 it runs smoothly between them, which gives you more control, more settings, and would also, in the rare case where you'd want to do it, allow you to actually control the aperture with one of those strange de devices they call a follow that, uh, that you can connect to your lens from the outside on the gear ring. You can actually choose to change your aperture during a shot if you want to, once you have an external aperture control ring. So another thing that's different on, on cinema lenses is they have a longer throw. That means that when you twist, say, the zoom on a standard DSLR lens, it goes about halfway around because that's as far as your wrist conveniently rotates. Whereas on a cinema lens, they use almost the entire revolution. In other words, out of the 365 degrees available around the lens, probably 340 of it will be taken up in the, in the process of of zooming. Now that may seem inconvenient and for still it probably is, but for, for, for video what you want is uh, more control, subtler control, smoother action, so that longer throw is actually desirable for video where you're actually doing this in the middle of a shot rather than throwing it from one end to the other between images the way you do in still. This is also this thing called positive stops or stop locks at the end. Uh, many lenses for DSLRs, when you get to the end of the control, say you zoom all the way to the end, the ring doesn't actually stop turning. It, it might start resisting differently, but it, it continues to turn. The problem with that is there are no fixed locations. If you can go past zero, then there's no way to know when you start turning the other direction when you get back to a given spot. So having fixed stops guarantees that you can control where you are within a range. So those are other advantages, subtle but valuable advantages to a cinema lens. 
And then the last two here are, are actually lens functions. Uh, Parfocal zoom simply means if I focus on the face of an actor with my lens at its farthest setting and then zoom slowly in to the actor's face, it will still be in focus on the actor when I get to the other end. That's not exactly true with the DSLR lens. It's close, but there's really no good way of adjusting that difference carefully. And so you need to have there be no difference. So the more expensive cinema lenses are parafocal, even though it makes them more expensive to build, so that there's no issue of having to adjust the focus as you zoom. Breathing is a similar function where as you zoom, the perceived uh, scale of, of field changes, which means if I, if I zoom in, it's going to change the, uh, the, the perceived size of, of the image, and you don't want that in video. Many of these things, it has to do with the difference between adjusting between shots in still and having to have it occur during shots with video. So while there are some video lenses, including the one that there's a little picture of up in the corner there, which actually costs less than high-end DSLR lenses, partly because they don't have the same build quality. They have nice lenses, but they don't have, for instance, all metal sealed waterproof cases. So if the lenses are less expensive to build, because you're not going to be using them outside in the rain, uh, then they can have excellent results while still being affordable. On the other hand, one can pay, oh, a small fortune for good video lenses. And of course, there's the matter of what lenses you can get in what mount. You can get Canon, Nikon mounts in, in a range of lenses. And those lenses can work on other cameras, such as Camera Red and Black Magic, as well as uh, being able to work on your DSLR. So there are some considerations of when you might want to buy uh, these dedicated cinema lenses for your work and when you might not. Oftentimes, uh, two or three dedicated cinema primes would be, meaning you know, non-zoom lenses would be a very good investment if you're doing much video at all. So next. So here is our next uh, poll. Where do you stand in terms of current DSLR video equipment? Do you own any? Just a mic or two? Advanced stuff intentional for it? Dedicated video gear? I think this will follow you know, the, the answers we got on the last poll question pretty closely. Hmm. I see people putting their answers into the, into the chat box again. Let's see. Here we go. I don't own any video-oriented gear. Almost half the people said that. Uh, but a th almost a third of them have a mic or one or two other items. So those are, that's the majority right there. Then about a quarter of them purchase tripods and gear with video in mind. So you're already thinking in the right direction. Hopefully after this video, after this webinar, Every one of you will think at least a little bit in that direction in the future. And then we have, ah, we have more than the 5% we had before. We have 11% that buy dedicated video gear or cinema lenses. That's way cool. So there are some who have not yet made it a major part of their work, but that are already buying dedicated gear. So they're thinking ahead. So next. So let's think about software now. There's a whole new series of apps to learn. Some people love learning new applications, and for most of it's like, it is like pulling teeth. So when you move from Photoshop or Lightroom or your other video editing applications, your other you know, still imaging applications to video editing, there will be some similarities depending on which application you move to. But they will not be identical, and there will be lots of new stuff to learn. So you have video editing tools, you have effects, which are special effects and things like titling and exotic things, you know, above and beyond transitions. Now, it used to be effects applications were purchased separately. You might spend thousands of dollars on a video editing app and then spend, well, several hundred more on one or another effects app and, and several hundred more on another one. It was very easy to chalk up tens of thousands of dollars in, in this kind of stuff. And then audio. Think about this. 
you know you need audio with video and you oftentimes end up building the audio separately and then merging it in and then there's music so um, you've got this situation where the kind of music that you can uh, steal from CDs or iTunes or someplace and use in the background of your video well first off that's not acceptable if the work is being used shown professionally or, or publicly and it's also typically not the right kind of stuff. In other words, music that's meant to entertain does not necessarily make good background music. So let's go back through the same list of four again, and let's just, I apologize for using Apple-based stuff, but they have kind of started a trend here. The newest version of Apple's Final Cut software, let's see, I think the last version was $1,000. I believe it was more than that earlier on. Uh, you can now get it for $300, and the interface on it is looks like iMovie, which some of the professional editors complain about this. They feel like they're being treated like children, but it makes it easy. Other people are going to eat their lunch because anybody can edit video with Final Cut X. Now, $300 for that and the effects software. There used to be hundreds of dollars worth of effects software. There was one app called Apple Color that was used for things like vector scoping we might get into just a tiny bit later. Um, those are kind of built in already now, and so the cost here is very low. Audio, well, there's this thing that comes not even with your professional package. It comes with iLife. It's called GarageBand. It does a fantastic job of clipping and cutting and merging audio tracks. And then, of course, you know what I'm going to say next. If you need to build your own music to suit, or to save money or to um, avoid uh, copyright issues. Background music can be built very nicely in GarageBand. You have to be, well, just a bit of a musician, not much of one, and you can uh, generate a nice background audio track there. So I've just covered all four of those concepts, and instead of saying, you know, save $25,000 and, and buy this stuff eventually, I've said, gee, you know, with a copy of I, I Life, which is, oh, you know, well under $100. I haven't even looked at the price lately. Uh, comes free with many of your computers, so I expect a lot of you already have it. And a copy of Final Cut X for $300, you could be in a position to do very, very serious, you know, saleable, make money with it grade, uh, video, audio, and music effects work. So keep that in mind. New formats. So most of you have heard of sRGB by now and have a sense about color spaces and what kind of formats you should be working in, JPEG versus RAW. Uh, how about learning all that over again? Uh, so for instance, how many of you know what Rec 709 is? We won't run that as a, uh, as a poll question, but it's a trick question. It's a video standard. It's used a lot on the web and in other locations that use that type of video because basically it uses the same color gamut, the same white point, the same gamma curve as sRGB. So Rec. 709 is really sRGB for video. So all these things, codecs, compression video formats, audio formats, um, you're going to have to learn just a little bit, enough to be dangerous, enough to make a couple simplifications and a couple of choices. So you don't necessarily have to become a, you know, expert in every one of these areas. You just need to know enough to make a decision and move on. So there's, there's things to be learned there. Next. Um, one of the interesting things is if you shoot raw still images versus if you shoot JPEG still images, um, unless you're going to do heavy editing, you're not going to see a, a major difference in the quality of the color. And that's not true, oddly enough, for, for video. When, when we shoot with DSLR cameras and still, we're often shooting raw, which means high bit. However, when we shoot video with those same DSLR cameras, we're shooting JPEG-grade video. In fact, oftentimes it's literally JPEG video. So we're busted back to JPEG. And, at the, and the way this works, I'm going to say this in an in a overly simplified way, it's 
if you're trying to scoop things out of the water with a fishnet and you have a fishnet that's got a coarse um, mesh in it, a lot of stuff's going to fall through. You're not going to capture as much of it. If you have a finer mesh net, you can capture more. So if we look at the, the difference between the 10-bit video that you get with professional video cameras, which is, say, 422 would be a, a modest 10-bit video, and then if you look at 8-bit video at 420, um, you're getting a lot less color. If you, if you process on the same camera with the same software, the 10-bit and the 8-bit version of the same shot, you're going to see that the color is just much weaker and less satisfying in the 8-bit. And yet, this is what we're talking about, these wonderful DSLR videos that we can make. Yeah, but they're JPEG, they're 8-bit, so there really are some limits there. That is where those other cameras that nobody quite understands why, I mean, they're just these little box that's smaller than a DSLR with no controls on them. Nobody really knows just what a camera red or a black magic is good for. And the answer is, it shoots raw. Now that raw, at this time, is only 10 bits, and 10 bits won't seem like much five years from now, when we're going to probably demand 12-bit video from our DSLRs and every other camera. But at the moment, 10-bit gives you significantly better color depth than 8-bit. And when you consider how large files are, the fact that shooting JPEG compression gets a lot more still images onto a card, you can understand it would get a lot more video onto a card as well. So we're going to have to have a lot larger cards a lot more cheaply before we can justify everyone moving to 10-bit, say nothing about 12-bit video, but we're going to have to let the camera companies actually provide us with 12-bit bit video before we worry about that. However, we can certainly see it in the coming in the future. Now, the last point on this slide has to do with white balance. Um, many of you understand that when you, when you shoot RAW, you can adjust your white balance in post-processing. When you shoot JPEG, you really have to have this white balance right in camera because making those kinds of big adjustments to the file later on is damaging to a JPEG. So we can make the direct analogy here. Making adjustments to the white balance in your video later on is going to be time consuming, but it's also going to damage your already weak color and your already shallow bit depth of your file. So it's very important that you do in-camera white balancing. So we'll show you in this next slide how that works. Well, maybe the slide after. New color standards. This is the fun stuff. Um, it used to be when I went to Hollywood and I asked anybody about color, they kind of held their fingers up in a little X in front of themselves like I was, I was some kind of vampire and they said, director's intent. And what director's intent meant was the only thing we care about in color is that the digital version looks exactly like the director's cut of the film did on film. Well, any of you who come from a professional still photography background can remember when the standard was the chrome. Chrome being a, a color positive like a, a slide, and except bigger. And of course, the chrome couldn't be, there's nothing you could do with it. You could look at it masked on a, on a light table in the dark, and it had a, a, a color range and a dynamic range beyond anything you could see any other way. And that was the standard, but it couldn't be met anywhere else, so it was kind of an irrelevant standard. Well, the deal here is the same thing. You've got this positive uh, film image to be shown in the dark, and it's got this incredible dynamic range and this brilliance of color. Well, what does that mean? That if you only show your films in cinemas in the dark, that you can get that color. What do you do when it comes to showing them on TV? There was never a, a way to get that dynamic range and that color on television. It was never a way to get it on the internet. So all of this has pretty much gone away because where do I watch? 90% of the movies I watch now, I watch them in my living room on what I pretend is a TV, but it's really hooked up to a Mac Mini, so it's really a computer monitor, and it's really through Netflix, or it's really through PBS, or it's really through oh, Hulu Plus. So none of those, none of those offer any kind of uh, uh, actual cinematography level experience, nor do they relate directly to director's intent. 
So the interesting things is once you get rid of the film, they can't point to it and say, make it look like that anymore. Things that are done digitally in the first place have to have digital standards rather than director's intent. So that's where color has gone to, is video standards. And the joke is that, for the most part, we won. Our standards are now being used by the video, film, TV, movie industries. So you'll hear things like, calibrate your TV, which you can do that with our Spider 4 TV product. And when you do, what do you calibrate to? Well, gamma 2.2, white point 6500. This sounds pretty normal, because that's what you calibrate to with your computer displays for the most part. So this last point here is, uh, <laughs> what would pirates do? There's a movie called Pirates of the Caribbean, the first one, where there were these pirates having a fight on a ship at night in the moonlight. And it's when you first realize they aren't really pirates, they're really magic. And, and when the moonlight shines on them, they're skeletons. And when the candlelight shines on them, they're pirates. And it was a clever piece of, um, of special effects, but it scared the producers to death because this was back when DSLR was not being used. This was being shot with big, expensive equipment. And yet it was when TVs were no longer you know, cathode ray tube CRT TVs. They were big flat panel TVs of one kind or another. And they were usually bought in the store in torch mode, meaning they were set extremely blue and extremely bright. And most people brought them home and left them that way. So they had various different devices that this would be seen on. They'd be seen in cinemas. It would be seen digitally in cinemas. It would be seen you know, in various ways on, on home TVs. And they wanted the pirate scenes with the, the moonlight and the candlelight. They wanted the candlelight to look yellow. And they wanted the moonlight to look blue. And they were scared to death that on some device it would be blue and bluer, or yellow and yellower. So they spread those two colors way apart so far apart that when we go back and watch that on a calibrated display today, we have to laugh because it's just so overdone. But it had, had to do with their fears of this new technology. So let's move on here. New ways of shooting. This is mostly about thinking in motion. The idea that you used to compose a shot, a still shot. Maybe you waited for someone to move into the image or move where you wanted them to be in the image. But you didn't actually capture the movement, you just waited until they were at the right point. Or you use machine gun mode and shot you know, a thousand images and picked the one where they were in the right position. Well, now you have to think creatively in motion if you're going to shoot motion shots. You have to learn to see the world in terms of motion. I watched a movie with my wife last night, and I was very careful not to point out the very brilliant cinematography camera work that was used that made some of the shots so effective because nothing makes a shot less effective than having your spouse point out how effective it is. So uh, I didn't do that, but I learned actually a couple of techniques from this. One being, if you have someone standing looking out a window, that you get to change the lighting and you don't need to have a reason. You can light them both sides of the face, full face, for half the scene and then you can turn one of your lights off. We don't know if a car moved outside or what happened. It doesn't matter. You don't have to explain yourself. You can just do this wonderful thing that kind of illuminates them differently and, and shows the three-dimensionality of their face by changing. And you just get to do that. And so I was so excited to see that that I jumped up and down on my end of the couch and tried to be quiet. So there's all this stuff that you get to learn. And of course, photography is a wonderful field where you can grow forever. And cinematography just adds new directions in which you can grow. It's big, it's scary, but it, it is exciting and interesting. Another thing you always end up incorporating once you start thinking in terms of video is sound, ambient sound, and of course, you know, the necessary sounds. The, the story I usually tell about this is I'm in Tuscany back when the 5D Mark II camera had just been released. I'm headed to Tuscany workshops. It's up in a monastery on top of a hill. They've just harvested the wheat field. So I can finally get out into the hill and do something I've been wanting to do all week, which is to capture a shot of the 
beautiful monastery on the hilltop underneath the boughs of an oak tree that stands in the middle of this field. So I'm a still photographer and I have an image in my mind and I know that if I get out there and find the right spot, it should be possible to capture that, that image. That's what fine art photographers and landscape shooters do. However, I've now got a, a motion camera with me, so of course I have a microphone. And of course I have you know, these other um, equipment and enough memory to do other things with me, but that's not what's on my mind. However, as I walk out into this wheat field, I look. And there's a sound coming from the tree. There's the hoo-hoo of a pair of doves. And I think, darn, now I have to get the microphone out and put it on. And I need to capture that ambient sound of those two doves in that tree. And then I realize, and then I have to actually keep shooting and walk towards the tree. And I really should have a steady cam because I'm going to walk over this tilled wheat field and I want a nice smooth shot and eventually those two doves will flush out of the tree and they're going to fly away in a nice arc in some direction. I don't know which way but hopefully it'll be not on the far side of the tree and I can capture them. And If they fly across the valley that will just make a beautiful, beautiful shot and there'll be that of their wings as they're flying. So I'm all excited about you know this new stuff that's got nothing to do with still photography. It has to do with video. And I did it and it worked and the Birds flew away as I thought they would, right across the valley, and, and it's all very exciting. And then no sooner had they done that than it's noon, and both of the, both of the uh, churches on opposite sides of the valley, the monastery that I'm headed to and the church and the town on the other side, start tolling their bells at noon. And they're much more melodic than American church bells, and they're in stereo. And I've got a stereo microphone. So now I'm happy as a clam just capturing a still image with this stereo sound coming in from both sides of the valley. And I'm so swept away by all this that I nearly forgot to take the still image that I was there to catch in the first place. Now, when I'm done, what have I got? I've got some video clips capturing some audio. The audio can also be used on its own. I've got a still image, probably shot several, but there's really one that I'm after here. And that entire package, that's not a movie, certainly not a movie or a TV show, but it's a, it's a group of related stuff that's more valuable in many ways. And unless I'm Art Wolf and, and sell you know, fine art still images all over the world, then chances are this is a more valuable package to me than the still image alone, and more saleable, and, and useful in many more ways. And what's it going to end up in? You know, an advertisement, who knows? It's going to end up somewhere uh, that I can sell it, that I can make more money from it than I could from a single still shot. So that's, that's my story. And I'm, I'm sticking to it, though I haven't sold that piece of video yet. So let's look at the next slide here. We'll keep moving on on the issue. Time intensive. If any of you have ever done video, you know that it's incredibly time consuming. The finest quality video, the little short things like advertisements are the most intensive of all. I did a two and a half minute video, the one I talked about doing in Sarah Silver's studio. It was for one of the data color products, Spider Gallery, testimonial video, target length was two and a half minutes. We spent one day, a full day, shooting that. What did we have? Two cameramen, a uh, producer, that would be me, sound guy, a lighting guy, hair, makeup, talent. So I've got like eight fingers up now. All day long, full day's work to shoot two and a half minutes of final video. And it then took the editor about two weeks to pull the product together, the project together. So that was, uh, that was two and a half minutes in a day with the better part of two weeks work by one person to process it. So if you're thinking about making a sample video for yourself to show how good you are, keep in mind what else you could be doing with two weeks of your life and a day of a, you know, entire crew's time. It's, it's not trivial stuff. And, and there are types of video that are not that intensive. How-to videos are, you know, often one camera instead of two. Often, you know, you shoot an hour's worth to get a half-hour final result. So it's not all that intensive, but it can be very intensive. 
and traditionally there are multiple experts involved. When you make a movie, the same guy doesn't do everything. I mean, there are not only a whole bunch of people with producer after their name and two or three with director, there are all these editors and cinematographers and, and all these people doing other things that they're specialists in. The beauty of digital is you have control. You get to do all this stuff. The curse of digital is you get control and responsibility and you have to do all this stuff. So yes, you can make your own movie, but how many man years are there in the making of a movie? Therefore, how long would it take you to do it by yourself and will you live that long? It's uh, pretty intensive stuff. Um, the other problem with video is you're bound to underestimate the first two or three paying jobs you try to do. And you know what happens when you underestimate is you work for free. So it's uh, a very dangerous area to get started and you must be cautious and you must have customers who trust you and are willing to pay you a generous amount or you will not make it work. So you know, this change in the, in the shoot time and post-process time ratios and you have to be very sure what, what your ratios are in order to be able to estimate what a project is going to cost. But this stuff's coming down over time. I mean, you can still make money in video in a way that you often can't in still photography, and yet it's coming down already. And it will. Don't plan on going into video and making a livelihood out of it for the next 20 years because you can see the future coming. The last testimonial video that Sarah Silver had made before the one she made with me, she had made for Adobe for the release of, I believe it was CS5. And so that was probably two and a half years earlier and it cost six to eight times as much to make as the one I made with her. That's how much things have come down and they've come down yet again in the year since then. I could make it cheaper today than that. So let's move on before we get too depressed about the time involved. Here's the, here's the flip side of that coin. You see all the dollar signs in here. Increased revenues from existing clients. ka -ching. New types of clients. Double ka -ching new opportunities in general. Um, I'm chasing this type of opportunities as we speak because that's what video allows me to do in a way that still does not. However, you'll notice we keep talking about clients and clients and opportunities. This is, this is kind of professional stuff. So let's think about this. If I go on vacation or on a business trip and I shoot 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 images while I'm there, I can fit them on my laptop hard drive. I can bring them back and put them in my image library. I can probably sell some of those somewhere along the way, even if they end up decorating hotels and conference centers. But it's something that you can do also as a hobby and do it for pleasure and do it for art. When you get into video, what are you going to do? If you, if you shoot a few minutes of video of a butterfly flapping its wings, it's a lovely thing. But it takes up a lot of space on your drive and are you going to keep it there and is there any use that you're ever going to have for this and how are you going to store it and where are you going to put it and what's it going to be used in. So pretty soon video starts running your life and you start wondering what you should keep and what you shouldn't and what, the, what you're going to use it for and it really all comes down to dollars. I don't know too many people who make fine art video projects as amateurs for the love of it. It's not as common as being a still photographer for the sheer joy of photography. So that's kind of where the bottom line on this comes down to, is that there be a bottom line. So next, here is our final survey. I bet the results will reflect the other two. What video software tools do you own? None or consumer products like iMovie or, you notice I worded this careful, Final Cut or Professional because there are those who consider Final Cut just to cut below Professional or Professional Software plus post-processing and effects tools. should be pretty quick to answer this. And I'm going to bet the numbers will follow the, the same general mix as the previous questions. So here we come up. Nothing so far, 20%. So that's lower than it was for any of the others. Um, I work with consumer apps like iMovie is 40%. And I'm going to make a statement here that is, I'm only postulating this. That is because 
iMovie's free or free with a, a bundle that you bought for other reasons. So, you know, it's more common to be used. 20% use Final Cut or Professional. Now I'm going to bet that a year ago the number who used that was 10, at most 15%. The cost of Final Cut X, it's $300 down from, you know, over 1,000 is, is a big, big deal. I own Pro, Pro Software Plus Pro, Pro ha, let me try this one more time, plus post processing or effects, 20%. So we only had, what, 4% that that regularly did video, and then we had, what, 10% or more who, who were buying tools specific to it, and yet 20% have both a video editor and post processing tools. So that's, that's pretty impressive. You guys, you guys are more ready on the software side than you are on the hardware side. So let's get into the thing that data color does while well, we've still got a few minutes left here. Color management. We all know about color management for still photography. You calibrate your monitor. You profile your printers. You use capture tools to get information about your light sources and, uh, and to calibrate your camera. So it's different here. You've got this thing called a video reference monitor that's not hooked up to a computer. It's just hooked up to a video stream. And it can't be calibrated like a computer because of that. It can be calibrated. You can still use your spider on it, but you have to use Spider 4 TV HD to calibrate it rather than, say, Spider 4 Elite because um, it's not hooked up to a computer. You have no video card. You have no video stream to control that same way. So, so you have to buy a separate piece of software or a cross-grade to one in order to calibrate that video reference display in order to trust what you're seeing as your final product. Unless your final product is going to go only on the web, in which case you can actually use your computer monitor as your reference display. Loops. Here's the magic term loops. They're actually see loops, color lookup tables. And in Hollywood I find it's pronounced LUTS. So um, I'm going to have to work on that one so they don't think that I'm an Easterner. LUTs and ICC profiles. If you, if you think of an ICC profile as being a lunchbox for color control, it's got on each end of the lunchbox, it's got these little curves that are built on that you can use or not use. And inside, it's got two or three things for your lunch. Actually, it's got three and a half things for your lunch. It's got um, three rendering intents plus an alternate on one of the intents. So it's got saturation. It's got... Um, perceptual, it's got color metric that can be either absolute or relative. So you've got all these things in there. Now if you reach into that lunchbox and you pulled out one single LUT, that is what they use in video. They don't use the whole profile. They don't use profiles at all, really. They just use LUTs. So that's really their tool. And we can build LUTs, but we're not really doing that as a as a dedicated thing for video at this time, though I'm certainly looking into how that could best be done. Now, some tools will work for both video and still, and some won't. We'll look into those in just a second. And you've got to keep in mind that color management video is still in progress. It's not something that's all finalized the way it is in, to a large degree in, uh, in still. So let's look at the next screen so we can see what some of these functions are. This should look familiar to all of you if you're familiar with color management. This is the digital color workflow for still photography. You start with camera control, things like the cube or the checker. You move on to display calibration, and the ICC profile that builds, that would be your spider. And then you go on to your printer, and if necessary, custom ICC print profiles if you're doing your own work. So if you look at that, and keep a close eye on the right side of the screen while Patty changes to the next one. That's where the big change is. Boom. What you're seeing here is, well, there's still stuff you can do with the camera, and the stuff you can do with the computer display is virtually identical. You could choose a video standard, but it's not going to make much difference in the calibrating your display. And then the big difference is that you've got this non-ICC calibration you have to do for your output video, for your video reference display. So if we move on, we can look at the first third of this, the capture side. Here are the tools you can use for video capture. They look pretty familiar because they're the tools that you use for still capture. 
we've left the lens cal out because you don't use autofocus for video, therefore you can't use autofocus calibration for video. However, you can use the cube, but to use the cube, you have to do that in post-processing. You have to um, vector scope or otherwise control to the cube. And as we've been talking about, that's fine for high bit, but it's not so good for DSLRs. So you can do exposure biasing for fixed balances. You can do lookup tables, HSL presets, lighting analysis. Let's move on to the next screen and see how this stuff really works. You all know that old myth about the 18% palm of your hand. If you don't have a gray card with you, you can use the palm of your hand. That's for exposure. It's not for white balance. Your hand is not gray. So that doesn't really work. Hit the next one. We'll bring up the next a cube here. That That is the replacement for a, a gray card for this. But you've got to understand that's got to be used in post. And therefore, it's while it's usable with a camera red, or it's usable with, with a black magic or a beyond. It's not all that ideal for a DSLR. So next addition here. This is the checker. Notice that it's backwards. The cards have been flipped over. You can use this for in-camera white balance. You hold it up in front of the camera. You set the white balance. The last video shoot I did, I didn't bring one of these. The videographers brought them. And they held one up in front of each camera for each shoot. And they used it to do in-camera white balance for every shot. Now, hit the next screen and we'll see. See those two rings? There's another thing you can do with this target for video. You can do exposure biasing. If you're fixing your exposure by setting it to this target, this target is medium color, medium density, so it's a good place to do an exposure setting. You hold it correctly to the lights and your exposure set to it with the camera. But you can then do exposure biasing. If you push up, towards the whiter patches, it will choke the camera down a little. If you push down towards the black patches, it will open the camera up a little. So this is clever ability to not only white balance your camera, but to exposure bias it. One more click here. See if there's another. Oh yeah, you can also close the case of the, uh, the checker <clears throat> like a clapper in front of all your cameras for sound syncing. Uh, many applications will do that sound syncing automatically, but you still need some sound for them to do it to. And if you're going to ever have to do it manually, it's nice to have a clapper to do that with. And since clappers are not terribly important anymore, you don't tend to carry a dedicated one. So uh, using the, uh, the case of the, the checker as a clapper has become uh, a clever alternate use. Now, camera color flavor. If I shoot with a Canon and a Nikon, the same scene, the same time, and then I mix them together, I can tell which is which. Partly that has to do with a different in-camera white balance that they estimate, and the other has to do with color flavor that can be fixed by the, the checker using the color patches. You can do that. It's possible to do that in still, and it would be possible to do that in your video editing apps if they allowed for it. So you got to understand that the, the, the software companies are pulling tools out of their raw converters, things like Aperture and Lightroom, and putting them into their video editing tools, which is very clever of them. Uh, but in doing that, if they pull the right features out, then we will be able to use our tools from still automatically in video, things like the checker. So one of the things I keep suggesting as I knock on doors in Silicon Valley is let's be as consistent as possible here so that we have as much back and forth consistency between still and motion as possible. So you can still get a good target out of the color checker. For instance, my workflow, if I was using Final Cut 10 today to make a video with two cameras, what I would do is I would shoot the checker target with each camera and then when I threw all my video in it would automatically sync it all self uh, according to the to the um, audio sync that would line it all up and I get to choose you know which shots were from which cameras and the transitions between them that's all great but if there's a color flavor difference I'm going to have to adjust one or the other of these cameras probably both and if I have a shot of our checker target to use for that, even though I'm doing it visually instead of having a software plugin to do it the way I can for still, 
what I'm going to do is be able to make adjustments that will um, match those two cameras up. And if I actually have HSL adjustments in the software, I can actually typically use the very same adjustments that I use for still. So that plus the clapper is really all you get out of your, your color target for, for use with uh, video. Let's move on and you can look at computer calibration. This, this one's easy. You use the same spider in the same way that you do to calibrate your monitor for still for motion. You might choose to use a different calibration standard, but like I said, Rec. 709 doesn't taste any different to me than sRGB, so that's really not an issue. Gamma 2.26500 is your video standard, so we're pretty much there. Now, the real problem is the video reference monitors and the fact that they require a whole different process because they're not computer-based. And Like I said, you can do that if you choose using Spider 4 TVHD. What that will adjust for you using the front panel controls on the display is brightness, contrast, color, tint, and white point. Those five things. I'd love to have it do a whole bunch more, but if it did, then we'd have to have training seminars on how to use it because it gets very complicated if you go beyond that. So at the moment, what we're doing is the, the things that we can do right in the user menu easily for people, and it does a pretty good job of simple video reference calibration. Now there are a bunch of playback devices for video. Whoops, can we go back one? A bunch of playback devices and they can all be calibrated to varying degrees as well. So projectors. No reason not to calibrate projectors, no reason not to calibrate TVs, particularly if you own Spider 4 TV HD to calibrate your video reference monitor, why wouldn't you use it on your TV? In fact, they might be the same device. And then, of course, iPhones, iPads, anything that you're going to be showing your video on. Uh, you can show your stills through calibration. If you want to show your videos, there's no color management for video on these devices. So you really have to be careful to get the iPad 3 or the iPad 4, not the iPad 2 or the iPad mini, because they don't have a color space that works with Rec. 709. Uh, again, with, with iPhones, iPhone 4 and 5, both have an sRGB color space, and therefore they would both show your, uh, show your video as well. So let's move on here while we still have a moment left. Lens autofocus calibration is not relevant to video. Covered that already, so we can jump right over it. Digital motion workflow. As we said, it looks a lot like still difference here is that instead of calling it capture display and print, we'd call it capture display and video. And either one you could call capture display output. Let's keep going. So we'll be working alongside you on this stuff. In other words, this is not a done deal. Um, we're learning this as we go along and they're making up the standards as we go along. So if you follow the spider blog, we'll actually be putting our first video related article up on the blog this week, I believe, uh, and it's on cinema lenses, and it's pretty uh, pretty detailed account of why you might or might not want cinema lenses. So let's move on to the last slide here, and you can uh, see that what we're going to do is offer you 20% off any Spider product in the next seven days if you'd like to order it at datacolor.com, the web store. And all you've got to do is use the discount code or die count code, as I typed here. That is listed as VIDEO20, all lowercase. So if you want to use this, I think it would be clever for you to scramble around and write that down. Either that or do a quick screenshot so that you get that uh, discount code. It'll get you 20% off any of the spider products for the next seven days on datacolor.com. So we thank you for attending. And what we're going to do is we will, we've recorded this video and we'll put it up on the Datacolor website and send you uh, a link to where you can see it again for any of you who really feel as though you need a second time through this to catch some of it. I'm hoping that it was uh, done in such a way that you feel you got it the first time. If you want other people to see it or you want to uh, force other people you work with to watch it, then uh, that's another value of the video. And of course there are plenty of people who are in different time zones and they're not watching this the first time around because, well, there's somebody who uh, wanted to watch this who's in the United Arab Emirates, so if she's watching and it's midnight 
below Diane. Otherwise, uh, she can see it tomorrow or the next day or the day after, depending on how quickly the, uh, the video gets uh, loaded to the website. So I'd like to thank you all for attending. And uh, we have attempted to answer some of your questions during the session. We're now running over time, so I think that probably we're going to leave it at that and not, um, not run any further Q&A. And uh, any questions that haven't been answered, you can uh, check back with us at, through support or uh, contact us at datacolor.com for more information. So thank you very much, and uh, we hope to see you at our next webinar.